Welcome to In Gear Podcast with your host, Dr. Roberto Marin, author of a hit book, PhD, in the USA. Study your master's or doctorate with a full scholarship, no strings attached. PhD in the USA is available on ingear.org and on amazon.com. Altaf Taki is a graduate student in the Department of Ocean Engineering at Texas A&M University. My name is Altaf Taki. Um, I'm a graduate student uh, at the Ocean Engineering Department uh, at Texas A&M University. Um, I joined um, January of 2016 uh, as a PhD student. Um, I finished both my bachelor's and my master's degree uh, back in Kuwait uh, at Kuwait University. Uh, both my bachelor's and my master's degree uh, were in civil engineering and I'm here um, trying to uh, do my graduate studies which is like getting my PhD in ocean engineering. Ocean engineering? Yes. All right. So is a big difference between ocean engineering and uh, civil engineering? Uh, yes. Um, I haven't, like, uh, like back home, um, because I took my master's and my uh, bachelor's in civil engineering, so usually, like, uh, I didn't take enough courses that are in the area of coastal and ocean engineering. So basically, I was able to take only two courses, like coastal one, coastal two, which is... It's still like in coastal engineering, but we're not so in depth. And apart from that, I took some courses like in structures, in geotechnical, and uh, uh, um, and like uh, construction management. Uh, but the big difference I saw when I moved in here and uh, in the ocean engineering department, uh, I have seen like uh, more in depth courses like uh, coastal engineering, ocean wave mechanics, uh, ports and harbors, marine dredging, which were highly beneficial for me. Um, to go more in depth in the area of ocean engineering. So that definitely showed me, like, in Texas A&M, they have a big, like, department that deals only with ocean engineering, and the students are required to learn more aspects of ocean engineering, and that was a big difference for me uh, moving from Kuwait University and coming here to Texas A&M. You did your, your master's uh, in Kuwait. Yes. Right? So you came here with already with a master's. Yes. But um, you have to... Um, I'm still required to satisfy exactly. the master's degree requirements in terms like, of courses. So I think it's 24 credits. Yeah, uh -huh. it's 24 credits plus... Uh, That's like eight, eight classes? Yes, and plus 64 credits in research. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Okay, so basically, uh, I, mean, I, think, it, I think the total is 64 credits. I'm did sorry. they recognize the um, your masters, or um, uh, it's like a, a, a start over from scratch? Yes, uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely say that uh, in order for me to be able like to move forward taking advanced courses, I should be able to have like a strong basis, which is like the master, like master level courses. So I wouldn't mind it, you know. I still like you know have some kind of. Uh, uh, like uh, from the course I already took satisfying master degree back home, these courses helped me to just like go like uh, like I mean I would say um, it's, it's it was not hard for me because I already knew some of the, these courses, but just taking them all over again and to be able to take the advanced courses coming mm -hmm. later. So I didn't mind it. It's still I have to start from scratch, but it was fine for me. You don't mind to take more classes, uh, yeah. so in somehow you enjoy it. Uh, I would I would not say like I wasn't. It's at first you know you have to look <laughs> at it from the point of view that it's required. Uh -huh. So you have to you are required to take these courses. And another thing you know, in, I would say in the first year because you are just like trying to start you know starting your research. So I would say the pressure was not as high as it is now, like in my second year. So at first you know when I took like three courses per semester. I was able, like, you know, to fulfill my course requirement and at the same time starting my research. So it was fine up until I finished my first year and then you are going more in-depth into your research and then your coursework became more like, like uh, you have to really, like, manage your time. Like a hazard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I would say it's, it's like you have to really manage your time between coursework and research. But uh, you have to do what you have to do. You have to finish up your coursework. Mm -hmm. It's going to take the first couple of years or maybe two years and a half, and then you're going to spend most of your time in your research later on. So, yeah. And do you have to take a qualifier examination or, or some sort um, of exam yeah, after yeah. you finish your cor coursework? Uh, you know, basically what's uh, in here in Texas a and they have uh, that you have to take a qual You are going to be eligible to take your qualifying exam after the first semester. 
like as a PhD student, um, and then if you cannot take it right after the first semester, you are still required to take it within the first year uh, from the time you joined the department. Um, for me, I took it. Uh, I took it once um, last uh, last January, which is like within my first year. I didn't pass it because that same time I had to plan for my experiment, so I didn't get enough time to be well prepared for the exam. So I'm going to retake it this summer, and it will be my second and final chance. Uh, but it should be easier because now I know more or less what to expect from the exam. So we'll be looking forward so to get that first step, taking the qualifying and just moving forward. From and that. now you know that you have to put aside everything and just focus on uh, studying for the exam. Yeah, um, you know, luckily, like the past one month and a half, you know, I was able to finish my physical model, uh, uh, my uh, physical uh, model experiments uh, here in the Haynes lab. So that really, you know, took a lot of like, the, uh, like from planning and actually doing the experiment it was now all taken care of, so I can move that away from my schedule. And basically, in the summer, I will spend. Uh, I would not say. I would say whenever I have time to do some analysis, um, uh, like post analysis from the experiment, and most of the other time I will have to study for my qualifying. But yeah, I, I'm not feeling that bad. You know, I'm just like uh, I'm like uh, getting my experiment is done. Uh, that just uh, it's a huge burden that I was carrying the past year, and I was able to. Uh, to complete it, so. So, are, are are you planning to finish your uh, PhD uh, in how many years? Um, basically, like because I'm a funded student, uh, I'm a funded student from my employer back home, which is Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research. Uh, I uh, I was granted like a four year uh, tuition covered scholarship, and so I'm looking at four to five years to be done with my with my mm -hmm. research work. So. Well, yeah. Let, let me share something with you. I, I had um, a lot of experience in a master's degree in organic uh, synthesis, which is the, I mean, I'm a chemist. Yes. And uh, when I started my PhD, I thought that I was going to be able to finish it in three years. Yes. And it took me six years. Yeah. That's the only, like, say that you don't, you cannot ask a PhD students when they're going to graduate because, like, you, you think you're going to graduate at a certain time, but then all of a sudden something happened, you know, and you have to stay here, like, one or two years longer. So it's basically take it, like, a step at a time and see uh, where you move forward from there. So Exactly. So can you tell us where uh, are we right now? What, what, is, uh, what, what is this place? Um, so w uh, where we are no right now is at Haynes Lab, which is a coastal uh, engineering lab facility here in Texas A&M in College Station. So basically, this is a, uh, uh, in this lab we have a wave basin um, that is. Uh, oh, I have to get the size. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, we have uh, this wave basin that is uh, 75 foot, uh, 75 foot wide, and it's. Uh, I forgot about the dimensions. What about in meters? Are you guys using uh, the international system of units in uh, Kuwait? Uh, uh, yeah, in Kuwait they are more like SI units. Uh -huh. uh, in here it's more like uh, so English for, units. Actually, I am, this, this is probably this recording is gonna go to people in in Latin America uh, and uh, Asia and oh. Africa. Oh, I see. And so they are gonna be more familiar with meters. So, yeah. what, what is this like a fifty meter wide? Uh, I think it's a thirty five meter wide, and I think it's uh, close to two meters deep, and it's uh, maybe I would say it's seventy five. Meter long, uh -huh. yes. Um, so basically, this is like a huge pool, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. an Olympic pool. Uh, yeah, and basically, in steroids. Yeah, and basically, like um, I have done my experiment in this lab uh, in order to be able to, uh, um, like, have like a kind of like a close to field scale model experiment. Um, um, want me to talk about my experiment? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically uh, me and my supervisor. Uh, his name is Dr. Jens Figlis. Uh, he's from Galveston, and. For me, I came in here. I wanted to do. I want to uh, do my research in the area of wave structure and sediment interaction problem. Uh, back home for my master's degree, I did like a wave structure interaction. So in here, he's working. Uh, in the uh, my supervisor is working in the area of uh, coastal protection. Uh, uh, in, um, I mean, uh, coastal protection scheme for the area in Galveston. Basically, this place is like um, a simulator. Yes, we are right. doing like, it's a, like a, a yeah. Is there an ocean simulator? Yes, yes. It's uh, more like we can do like physical model tests, and we can uh, uh, actually you know get like the wave condition. We can get it from the field, uh -huh. and we can uh, scale it down. 
and we can also scale the size of our structure down. We can do like some calculation based on the wave condition, and this is how we design our breakwater. And then we can scale it down because you know this lab is. It's not going to be the field. It's, uh, it's like uh, it's like uh, I would say it's kind of contained uh, or like constrained. It's constrained by its limitation. So basically, we have to see what is the capabilities, you know, of like let's say of the lab as a as a as a as a kind of uh, I would say as a structure or something, and also with the with this wave maker. And then we have to scale down our structure in order to be able to satisfy or in order to be able to test. Um, our idea in the, in the wave basin. So, uh, so, what type of instrumentation do you have here to do your measurements? Oh, uh, the instrumentation. Um, we at first, you know, we have the wave maker, which is the uh, which is a unidirectional wave maker, able to send uh, waves, uh, head-on waves, and also oblique waves. And we have to create the files, and we have to create the files in terms of like. Um, uh, let's say, in like in the wave condition, in terms of wave height, wave period, wave angle, and the duration of the test, and we feed this file as a signal to the wave maker in order to run the wave maker. So this is the most important instrument that we have in here. And then I have other instruments that I use them to collect my data. And these instruments are like wave gauges. And the wave gauges, um, I use it to measure the water surface elevation. Okay, so we're just um, stepping inside a big pool. Yes. So we have this, uh, this beach rock that is located at the end of our wave basin. And basically the objective of having this rock beach is to absorb the wave energy as it's propagating from the wave maker all the way to the beach rock. So we get like a minimum reflection that might, you know, affect um, like some calculations we do with the wave gauges. So having the rock beach is just like as an absorbing beach, absorbing the wave energy. So once the waves will reach there, we will have a minimal wave reflection going back to the wave maker. Yep. So these wave maker, you know, you can control each wave pedal by itself. It has like a uh, 48 single wave, uh, wave pedal. So uh, you can control like each one by itself or you can run, run them all at the same time. And so basically you can do magic. Um, yeah, but uh, <laughs> I'd have my technicians to do the magic for me. So I have been really fortunate having uh, very um, kind of very helpful technicians here in the lab to help me do my experiment. Yeah. So w when I met you um, about a week ago, yes, um, you were commanding a crew of men here. Yes. So um, um, how did you learn your uh, to be a leader? Uh, you know, I I have not been like I was like leader like I would, if you ask me this question maybe like ten years back I haven't had this thing in me, but uh, I found, like, um, you know, during my bachelor's uh, studies, um, we have to do some kind of, like, a course project, and basically, like, someone has to step up, you know, and lead the group, and I found myself, you know, that uh, I can, like, uh, taking some of these courses back during my bachelor's degree, I found that I have this kind of a leader kind of leader skills in me, I would be able to lead and encourage my team um, to have them like um, uh, like do the work and be able to submit all the tasks that we need and submit like the projects on time. And from there, you know, I just kept moving forward. And after, I would say after 10 years uh, from firstly doing that, I found that it's just, it's a matter of just uh, getting everyone on the page and encouraging them and giving them like a good plan of what to what to be done and what to expect and that should go like with time you know each, each time we have to submit something or each day we have a kind of like a schedule uh, like a plan to, to fulfill and that should be good you know and people like in here so far you know they have been really great you know of, like really cooperative and really willing to do the work and yeah it, it, there will be some days you know that you feel you are not in top on top, you know, <laughs> leading the things. But so far, you know, we were able to do that. So Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, by the way, what motivated you to become an engineer? Okay. Um, actually, like, uh, I would like to, if I would say I, was, I want to be an engineer, like, from my early childhood, I wanted to be a doctor. But uh, somehow, you know, after I graduated uh, from my high school, it's just uh, I had to make a decision. Actually, my GPA didn't helped me to be enrolled in School of Medicine. So my second thing was to, to be an engineer. And, you know, I was lucky that, you know, if, now if you ask me this question back, I would say I'm le really lucky to be an engineer. So, and it's just like, you know, to be able like to build something, you know, or like to, um, 
engineer something for the people, you know, for them to use and making sure that you do it in such a way that it's going to provide some, like, some kind of, like, some good service, you know, for the community and to be able to do that with the best ability and knowledge that you have, you know, it's something really good. So I'm, I'm really, like, excited now I'm doing my PhD and that should just make me more knowledgeable, you know, to give more, to give, uh, excuse me, to give back to my community in, in, a, in a bigger way. So uh, being an engineer is just like a blessing for me and I, I hope I can uh, learn more and do more and uh, just uh, keep doing that, yeah. So we decided to come inside the office yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and sit down, okay. uh, which is great. Um, so uh, when did you start thinking about uh, studying abroad? Down here, so I was shooting to do my master's here in the U.S. So I applied. I didn't go there for my master's due to some uh, funding issues, but I always had that in back of my mind. I was always encouraging my 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 uh, like uh, um, I mean my cousins and stuff. If you get the chance, just go and do it. It's going to be a great opportunity. So ba basically, yeah. you had a hard feeling yeah. that it was going to be great, and yeah, but you, I didn't do it. You came and you realized, yeah. Yes. It is great. Yeah, so basically when I get the chance uh, from my employer who, who actually um, supported, uh, give me a scholarship, I was like, just let me just take it and do it. And I was really happy, you know, being here in the U.S. And, you know, just like you want to see, like sometimes you think that you, you are doing good, but sometimes when you are there and taking the classes and seeing like... Um, like how well that you're gonna do this school because some people they are afraid they said okay I did my bachelor's I think I'm fine I did my master's I think I'm fine but for me after I had a couple of previous experiences being here in the U.S. and like going to different conf conferences you know it's part of my like you know my work back home it's just like why don't you do it you know and I think I can survive you know like being away from home and doing my studies so I just took this chance you know when it, first thing when it happened and here I am. So. You are, you have failed uh, homesick. Uh, yeah, I do. I do feel homesick. Yes, yes. And uh, how do you overcome that? It came more into perspective that I'm here, uh, I'm away from my family. I'm doing this thing, and it's getting tougher with time. I would say so. From last year and this year, it became tougher. So when you have tough times, you need someone by your side, you know, and like a close member of your family. And uh, having that not there, it's really put you in that kind of questioning that why I'm here, you know, does it is it worth it of me leaving my home and leaving my family to do this thing? Although I know I will be getting, you know, my PhD degree later on, but like during the first couple of years, I have been told it's hard. So now I am more like I I feel like I already crossed that thing of the adjusting thing, adjusting phase. Now I'm just making sure that, you know, to do what I need to do to just move forward. So homesick, homesickness is already there, um, but just keeping in touch with my family every now and then and just making sure that, you know, getting their kind of emotional support and, you know, and having some members of my family planning to come here and be with me, you know, it should it should not be that hard. It should be okay, but... Family sickness is definitely there, I would say. So, uh, what are your plans uh, afterwards? Um, you mean after graduation? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, basically, like, my plans are already set uh, because um, back home, you know, I have this position of a research associate. And uh, basically, after I, after four years, um, I'm getting my PhD degree because I'm being funded from my employer back home. Uh, and I suppose to after I finish my PhD, I have to return back home to uh, to have a higher position. So I'm gonna move from being a research associate to be a research scientist. Uh, what is your message to the undergraduate students that are considering studying an advanced degree abroad? Um, I would I would highly encourage them to take on any chance that they have. Um, to pursue their higher studies or graduate studies in the U.S. or maybe anywhere else. It's just like a great opportunity. It's not about like academic anymore. It's just about putting yourself out there and like uh, learning about kind of like other countries' culture and being able to uh, gaining some skills, you know, um, getting some skills of like, I would say survival and like being able to meet new people and do your academic and just uh, putting yourself uh, or having a new opportunity to even advance, you know, you already get the knowledge, you know, I would say in your bachelor's, but it's going to be good, but it's also doing your master's or your PhD is just going to help you to move 
forward and be more specific in the area of research that you are doing. So just don't say it's it's hard. Don't say it's difficult. Don't say my family would say. Just believe in yourself that you can do it. And you know, you will be able to do it. And when you look back, you know, you will be so proud that you took up this opportunity and you were able to do it, yeah. So. Altaf, Taki, uh, thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, you have been very generous saying good luck. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for having me for this interview. I truly appreciate it.